Okay, welcome everyone to the fifth webinar of the ERN Guardheart webinar series. Uh, today we will talk about complex cases of sudden cardiac death and inherited arrhythmias and what do the guidelines say. Um, I will give a special uh, welcome to our moderators of today, Dr. Arbello uh, and Professor Veld Hansen, and also to the two speakers of today, Professor Sane and Dr. Sarkella Brugada. And today um, we will also make use of polls during the, uh, during the case presentations to have a bit more uh, interactive uh, webinar. Uh, so Professor or Dr. Arbello, I will give the word to you now. <laughs> Thank you everybody. I'm really happy to be here. Today we have a wonderful panel for a very interesting topic. I'm happy to be here. The topic is particularly interesting. Um, in for our thematic areas one and three and it is the evaluation of patients of families with an event of sudden cardiac death and um, we have the honor of having here uh, professor johan sanen from Antwerpen. Uh, he's the head of the cardiogenetic uh, unit at uh, his center and um, also to have georgia sarkeya brugada the head of the arrhythmia junior uh, and the cardiogenetic unit in the pediatric hospital here in barcelona hospital san joan de deu and of course we have one of the chairs of the esc uh, guidelines that were published this year for the management of ventricular arrhythmias and southern cardiac death professor jacob felt hansen and um it will be really interesting to see what uh, he has to uh, say or his vision of these two cases uh, in view of the guidelines uh, on top of that uh, for the discussion panel uh, there will be me and uh we will also have the honor of having here together with us, Professor Arthur Bilder. Thank you. So without further ahead, we will have the two cases. Uh, we welcome people to bring up questions on the chat, uh, but the open question uh, we will leave for the discussion at the end. So we will have the two cases and then Professor Jacob uh, Phil Hansen uh, give us the view on the guidelines and then we'll have an open uh, discussion panel with the speakers uh, and other participants. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Johan, if you can go ahead and tell us your case. Okay, thank you for the invitation to present the real-life case. Let me just uh, first uh, share my screen with you. Okay, can you see my screen and can you all hear? Yes, we can. Okay, so this is a real-life case uh, of a 24 years old female who was uh, known in post-exertional prodromal syncopies uh, before the age of 15, for which she had a cardiac workup done in another center already at that time, and it was found to be completely normal. She has a brother, Matt. Of course, all the names here in this case are fictitious, uh, but to make it uh, easier, I, uh, I gave them all a name. Um, so she had a brother, Matt, that died uh, in 2020 due to uh, at the age of 26 during rest. Um, and the current issue uh, with which she presented was angina discomfort during exercise, and she told us uh, that uh, her brother had these two. Um, she was really worried when she came to our clinic um, and she actually said, I'm feeling really worried, um, I'm going to die. And she, we could not reassure her. We did a physical examination that did not show any abnormalities. And due to the fact that uh, she had a, a history of a sudden cardiac death in her uh, first degree relative, and she had suspicious symptoms, which we could not completely uh, place. Um, there was, I think, was a, a good indication to uh, to do a further clinical workup in our uh, in our patient according to the most recent guidelines. I think this is a, a very class uh, high class uh, indication to do this. And this was, of course, the baseline ECG in our patient, where you can see that she was in sinus rhythm. She had these uh, moderately elevated uh, voltages in the in the frontal and in the precordial leads, but nothing really diagnostic. But what I think you can really see is that this is a clear abnormal ECG with negative T waves beyond V2, which always should uh, warrant further investigation because there might be something underlying in this patient. So that's also exactly what we did. And due to the fact that this was a patient with a sudden cardiac death in the family, these kind of cases in our center are always managed by the cardiogenetics team, where this team is a multidisciplinary team where you have uh, uh, two cardiologists. One is specialized in electrophysiology. The other, one, the other one is specialized in heart failure, together with a clinical geneticist, with the genetic counselors, and also with a psychologist in case of need, of course. Uh, this, this is the team that actually manages these patients and does the further workup uh, in conjunction with each other, um, so in a multidisciplinary fashion. 
And I think here also the role of the genetic counselor is very important. So we uh, contact our counselor to uh, have a, a thorough discussion already before we do other investigations in such patients to manage the expectations about results, to manage of the tests that will, uh, will be performed, uh, to manage the expectations about uh, management uh, proposals, of course, about the treatment. Also to talk about knowns, unknowns and uncertainties that might come along during the diagnostic workup and the diagnostic process. Um, and also to identify early signs of psychological need in these kinds of uh, cases. And our genetic counselor uh, then compiles a pedigree where you can see our patient here, which is uh, the 24 years old uh, lady that came to our hospital. This is her brother, Matt, that died at the age of 26. There was a forensic autopsy performed in this patient, uh, but it did not reveal any clear diagnostic uh, or diagnosis uh, uh, leading to the, to the cause of death. So the sudden cardiac death, death case uh, in this patient became sudden unexplained death syndrome or SUTS. Um, our patient also told us that she has a, a mother of 47 years old, still alive, and she was known with something which was called a sports heart. Um, we don't know what that exactly means, but of course, that was uh, what was uh, said to us. She also had three siblings, so a sister and a brother that are still alive, and she also has a brother um, that, uh, that uh, was a construction worker and that died in his 30s. And further down the pedigree, um, um, she also told us that there were multiple patients that died at, uh, at quite an early age, but she couldn't remember the, the reason, she couldn't remember any of the circumstances. So, of course, the further we go in the pedigree, the less certain, of course, the information becomes. So, of course, we have to wonder, based on this pedigree, whether this, uh, her mother uh, has uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, whether this in the, the construction work, worker also died of sudden cardiac death. And of course, if there are multiple patients that have died suddenly at a at young age uh, without any other uh, identifiable cause, um, of course, it might not be completely true based because it's already for, um, several generations down the pedigree. But if it is true, there may be a, uh, a sudden cardiac death syndrome uh, going on in this family that hasn't been discovered until now. So we went on with, uh, with the clinical workup in our patient. We did, we did an, uh, an exercise test. And what you can see is that there's a normal acceleration of the heart rate during the exercise test, but there was an abnormal increase of the blood pressure so that the blood pressure curve was actually flat, um, which there was an abnormal augmentation. And what we could see was that during peak exercise, the repolarization abnormalities in the precordial leads actually became more pronounced. We did an echo in this patient, which uh, showed only a prominent septum. It was uh, protocoled as completely normal, but we did an MRI because of the, the, the strange findings also on the, on the uh, exercise test, which we couldn't, uh, which, which couldn't explain until then. Uh, and it showed a slight septal, septal wall thickening with a maximal wall thickness of 13 millimeters and no, absolutely no evidence of myocardial fibrosis. We also did an exercise echo, and what we could see was that there was a very limited contractile reserve, so the stroke volume did not increase during exercise, which was also something very, something very strange. We did an, a 24-hour halter, which is part of our routine workup in such cases, which did not show any bradyarrhythmias, or tachyarrhythmias, no non-sustained VT, no malignant arrhythmias whatsoever. Uh, next, we did a coronary CT. She's young, and she has these repolarization abnormalities during exercise, so we wanted to know uh, whether there was something wrong with the coronaries. We didn't find, so the calcium score was zero. She had no significant stenosis in the coronary arteries, but we did find an anomalous retroaortic course of the LCX. And this brings me to our first question of today. So what is based on the, the clinical presentation until now is your clinical diagnosis. So we can start the poll uh, with uh, four possible answers. Was this a malignant anomalous LCX anatomy? Could this be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Is, the, is this definite hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or is this something else? And then I think you have to think for yourself what you would make of it. So we will give you about 15 to 20 seconds uh, to answer the question. And then we can see the results. Are the results coming in, uh, Ninke? Uh, yes, I think so. I'm not completely sure, but we will see in five seconds. I will try. Because, yeah. yeah, here are the results. Very nice. 
So some of you think indeed that it is a malignant anomalous course of the LCX, but I think the, uh, the LCX is passing behind the aorta. So it is the course is not in between the aorta and the truncus pulmonalis. So you would not expect during exercise that there is a compression of the, of the LCX. So uh, this is just a, a coronary an, uh, aberrancy, but it is not a malignant course. So we don't think this is the reason why there is this repolarization abnormalities during exercise. And then many of you think it is uh, it could indeed be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I think very interesting, uh, based on what we've presented until now, is that no none of you actually said this is definite hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I think I, I fully agree with uh, with that uh, with the absence of that answer. So let's look at, uh, at uh, the rest of the case. So uh, if so, the definition of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy we know that it is an end diastolic wall thickening of at least 13 milli, uh, 30 millimeters in familial setting or 15 or more millimeters in sporadic cases, and of course, in the absence of abnormal loading conditions, such as hypertension and valvular disease. So I think we can agree that the phenotype we've presented here does not completely meet the diagnostic definition of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but I think we can also agree that it is most consistent with a form first hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in, uh, in, uh, in development, so an er maybe an early stage. So based on this tentative diagnosis, we also make a risk stratification, uh, and the five-year risk stratification for sudden cardiac death in such a case, based on what we found in this patient, is about 3%. And then my next question to you is, uh, for the poll, what management, management strategy would you propose for this patient? Would you say, okay, we just let her go, no cardiac follow-up needed, we need to, to follow her up closely, or we need to give medication and do close follow-up? We give medication and a an, uh, uh, loop recorder for full disclosure rhythm uh, follow-up, or we give medication and an ICD. And then let's start the poll. So about we give you about 15 to 20 seconds to uh, answer the question. And then we will discuss further. Okay, so here are the results. So nobody uh, lets her go. That's a, I think it's a very good answer. So the majority of you says indeed to uh, to do close follow-up, but no medication. Uh, and some of you would even give her an ILR, although we don't have any arrhythmic uh, evidence that there is uh, arrhythmic abnormalities in this patient. But uh, so let's look um, let's look at uh, at what uh, at what the guidelines say. So the older guidelines say that indeed when the and also the the, the re most recent guidelines. Um, uh, say that indeed when the five years sudden cardiac death risk, risk surpasses six percent that indeed an ICD is warranted and 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 when the sudden cardiac death risk uh, surpasses four percent and there's more structural abnormalities found such as LV aneurysm or uh, a high burden of fibrosis an ICD may still be uh, suitable uh, and may still be considered. Um, so in this patient we didn't have any fibrosis and the, so the five year sudden cardiac death risk was only three percent so um, here we we had a, a um, we tried to come to a shared and informed decision with our patients. So we discuss all what is what we know about the case, also the uncertainties uncertainties about the case and the, the current risk, and based on what we know in the literature and on the guidelines. And um, putting all these data together, we came to the uh, shared informed decision to give her medication because she does have uh, uh, repolarization abnormalities during the exercise and to uh, closely follow her up. And we told her that we have at this point insufficient evidence for an ILR uh, or an ICD, um, which is uh, in line with our guidelines, I think. But of course, this patient was, uh, was part of a family where there was a sudden unexplained death syndrome. And uh, I think that to complete the picture, we also have to look at the genetic uh, information that is still available in this case. And for that, of course, we, uh, we did a molecular autopsy. We obtained the DNA from, from the forensic uh, pathologist and we did a genetic analysis on this uh, on the on the brother that uh, died suddenly at the age of 26. And in those cases, we first look for uh, electrical diseases because we know that when there's sudden cardiac death at early age, the the uh, the likelihood of finding an electrical disease is the highest. We did an electrical panel uh, of 60 containing 60 genes, and uh, that was completely negative. And due to the fact that we also find uh, indications for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in, the, in our patient, we also did a cardiomyopathy panel and we found this variant in troponin T2. 
Um, so, of course, when we find this variant, it does not mean necessarily that this is disease causing or that it is uh, even uh, linked to the phenotype that was presented in our patient and also in the rest of the family. So we have to adjudicate a classification of pathogenicity to this variant. Uh, and for that, we apply the ACMG guidelines to come to a ACMG classification from UV class 1, which is, which is benign, to UV class 5, which is pathogenic. But to make this genotype-phenotype correlation, we again come back to, to our team where we bring together our molecular geneticists, the clinical geneticists, and all the clinicians involved to, to come to the best interpretation of these variants uh, in, in such a case. Um, and when we walk over all the data, first we look at the frequency, which was, uh, we saw that this variant was non-existent in large control databases. We found this variant was uh, was already uh, published in databases LOVD um, as a variant of unknown significant, uh, but also as a pathogenic uh, variant. We also looked in ClinVar, where, where it was already described once as a likely pathogenic variant and uh, four times as a pathogenic variant. But of course, we also have to think for ourselves. So we also look at the phylogenic conservation, and we saw that this nucleotide was moderately conserved, but the amino acid uh, derived from it was highly conserved, up to 12 species, up to the zebrafish, which probably means that this uh, amino acid is important in this uh, particular position. Although that the physical uh, physical chemical changes uh, from arginine to the uh, to the other uh, amino acid is uh, probably uh, small. We also look for splicing effects, and for that we use an algorithm, which also showed that there is uh, probably no splicing effect uh, due to this variant. And we look at the in silico predictions, which are algorithm-based programs that will tell you whether this, this might be um, uh, uh, damaging or not. And here, almost all the prediction programs were in line with each other, which is rare, uh, but also saying that probably this, uh, this variant is damaging. Then further on, we look in the literature for genotype-phenotype correlation, whether these variants in troponin T2 may be linked indeed to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, phenotypes. And indeed, this was the case, so it can uh, account for 5% of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy phenotypes that are around. And striking, um, if you look at the literature, um, in 20 about 20% of the cases, these hypertrophic cardiomyopathy phenotypes uh, display a normal ECG and normal echoes when they present uh, themselves, but with a high arrhythmogenic burden. Further on, if we look at functional data, we can see that uh, uh, mutations in troponin T2 indeed lead to sarcomeric disease with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as a manifestation. And even more important, when we uh, search for co-segregation data, looking whether the genotype, um, this particular genotype can be linked to the, to the phenotype, we found this 2016 paper from the Spanish group uh, that uh, actually showed that there is a clear co-segregation in multiple patients between this genotype and the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy genotype. Um, constituting a founder population that causes early onset hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, with a high arrhythmogenic burden and a very high risk for sudden cardiac death. So adjudicating the ACMG classification, this is a truly pathogenic class 5 pathogenic mutation. Um, and based on this, if you look again at the guidelines, then we have to do uh, screening in the uh, first degree relatives. And that's exactly what we did. So this is our pedigree. So we found this class five mutation in our uh, in the, the patient that has uh, had deceased. And we found the same mutation in our patient, indicating that she is carrying a, a class five pathogenic disease causing uh, a mutation that can cause hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So the final diagnosis in this patient, if we just look at the morphological uh, classic uh, uh, um, uh, de um, definition for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy remains uncertain for first hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But if you do the full cardiogenetic workup in this case, this is a confirmed hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with only a septal wall thickness of only 13 millimeters, but with abnormal exercise augmentation and exercise induced repolarization abnormalities, but carrying a disease causing class 5 troponin T2 mutation. And if we then look for the risk stratification uh, uh, based on the Spanish population, we know that only 50% of these patients are still alive at the age of 50. So there is a very high risk for sudden cardiac death in, in carriers of this, uh, this, typical, uh, this particular uh, mutation. So applying the classic risk stratification, we wouldn't have in, uh, implanted the patient with an ICD, but when we come to the cardiogenetic, the full workup and the full cardiogenetic stratification, we can say that the five-year sudden cardiac death risk in this patient is, a, is about 10%. And then I think uh, we can all agree on uh, the fact that this patient uh, uh, is in need of an ICD to protect her for uh, sudden cardiac death in the future. 
So, and then of course we have to further do the, the, the screening in the family with the workup in the first degree relatives. So we did a screening in the mother and she was also carrying the same mutation. And then of course this warrants further screening in the first degree relatives of the mother uh, and so on to prevent sudden cardiac death. And this brings me to the conclusion of this case where I think we can say that cardiogenetics is key to better sudden cardiac death prevention where molecular autopsy can help solve cases. But of course we need to obtain a good DNA sample which is not always uh, easy, but I think it is worthwhile to try and obtain such a DNA sample from uh, autopsies that have been performed elsewhere. Um, I think it is also important to stress that we need thorough phenotyping to, uh, to best interpret our genotype-phenotype correlations when we find genetic variants. And I think the genetic diagnosis in this case was a real game changer um, that can lead to tailored management of uh, patients and their families, and that can lead to precision, precision medicine. And then the final slide that I want to stress is that it, um, this, these kinds of cases uh, should be managed in a cardiogenetic multidisciplinary team where multiple, uh, where the input of multiple disciplines is important with a clinical geneticist, with a molecular geneticist working together with the clinicians, the, um, the genetic counselors, and sometimes also the psychologists to come to the best care for these patients and, uh, and their families. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Johan. Uh, without further ado, I would love to invite Georgia to present us with her case of sudden cardiac death, this time in a child. Georgia, yes, okay. Perfect, we're seeing your screen. Um, I think you're on mute. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not muted, right? Okay, yeah, now I, we can hear you and see you. Okay, so um, uh, thank you very much, and uh, it's a pleasure being here. Uh, let me share you this um, nightmare that happened in the middle of the night, of course. Um, this is, sorry, this is a, a 10-year-old boy who, um, with a personal history of just one episode of seizure, seizure while playing Nintendo at age nine, uh, he he had a, ne a neurological screening, which was normal, with electroencephalogram and a normal MRI, and he had had no further episodes. Um, what, what happens is that in the middle of the night, he wakes up, screams, goes to the parent room, uh, complains of acute abdominal pain, very acute and severe abdominal pain, and he faints. Um, he uh, when, when they call the, the ambulance, he is found in VF. He needs three electrical shocks to revert to sinus rhythm, and he's transferred to our hospital uh, for hypothermia treatment as the, um, the, 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 cardio, the, the cardiac arrest has been prolonged. Um, the outcome is very poor. In fact, um, he, he's diagnosed with an intestinal bleeding related to a uh, mesenteric ischemia, probably with a mal rotation of the, of the intestines. He, have, he has a very severe neurological impairment, so we are obliged to limit the uh, therapeutic efforts and he dies 24 hours later. Um, he, the good thing, uh, well, the, the, the first question here would be uh, why an intestinal ischemia turns into VF? Well, um, first is at this age, meningococcal infection is the more, more probable diagnostic. Ventricular fibrillation is often related to abdominal bleeding. Ventricular fibrillation might have a non-abdominal origin, and BF was most probably an artifact. So I think we could close the poll. Okay, so um, thanks, thanks God the, the, the artifact was ruled out. <laughs> it was not that clear when you see the tracings, but of course uh, the, the outcome um, uh, makes us think that something's wrong there and it's not artifact. So uh, yeah, we need to study a little bit more and think uh, further on that. So, uh, but anyway, the further diagnosis at this charge was intestinal ischemic episode leading to abdominal bleeding, leading to hemorrhagic shock and subsequent severe neurological impairment. But, um, well, that uh, we don't like this type of diagnosis, uh, mainly because there is something here that uh, it, it kind of 
uh, angry us a little bit, it's the, the BF, right? So um, the good thing is that one of our team was on call the following day and there were there was a little bit of blood kept uh, in a tube somewhere in some fridge. So um, we decided to, to run um, uh, genetics on that. And what we got was a genetic variant on Rayanadine 2 gene. It's, uh, there are no reports, no, not even, not at that time, which was uh, nine years ago, uh, not at that time, no, not yesterday when we checked, no reports, no evidence in databases, no hotspot at the exon level, but uh, in silicic co-prediction, um, uh, it predicts as pathogenic. I, we know that it says nothing, but this is a very important information that when very rare things happen, and you find very rare genetics that it's not described anywhere, at least you should take uh, uh, that into consideration. So what should we do with this? So number one is forget about it. He had abdominal ischemia. We know the reason of death, so nothing else, no further uh, um, uh, examinations. Uh, definitely he had a CPVT and despite the ischemia, C, not sure about the genetics. We may call Arthur Wilde or the, the, the experts on uh, CPVT and uh, maybe they can just uh, put some light on this. Um, family segregation can, can help us or do family segregation, but call Arthur anyway. Please vote. We have 20 seconds for voting. There might be more than one <laughs> option feasible. Okay, I think we can close the voting. Arthur, you're going to have a lot of work here. Yes. Okay, <laughs> anyway, so um, everybody would uh, do family or almost everybody would do um, family segregation. And not sure about this, definitely uh, CPVT diagnostic uh, with this genetic variant. We, it's, it's suspicious, but not definite. And uh, probably family segregation is going to give us a lot of light despite Arthur. <laughs> and um, so this is the, the family tree and this is our boy and uh, who died. And what we saw is that uh, grandparents were dead, uh, died, um, we don't, they, it was not clear, but what we know is that the mother uh, used to have a couple of syncopies, which they said they were vaso, vasovagal um, when she was young and also had the sister. They, they, they both were carriers of the, sa the same mutation and um, the um, also the the youngest of the of the um, of the family here um so um this was when the when we did um, clinical screening of her um we could not find much in the mother and the auntie but but in this young uh, 11 year old we could find with a, t a halter t-shirt that we could find all this arrhythmia mm -hmm. during um during a, a, a very anxious moment when she was carrying it mm -hmm. so um what should we do with this girl and this is an open question no poll on that and uh, what what would be the attitude here on what would the guidelines say in this uh, situation and um, thank you very much Thank you, Georgia, for also a, a very interesting case. I think, um, well, I would recommend that everybody that has a question, uh, either they keep it for the end or they already start uh, bringing them up in the chat. And then I, now I would like to invite Professor Jacob uh, Felhansen to give us the perspective of the 2022 AC guidelines of ventricular arrhythmias and cardiac death. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, first of all, thank you for two very nice um, cases, uh, difficult cases, and also challenging from various perspectives. As I see it, both management and brings out a lot of the things that we have tried to um, cover in these uh, guidelines. Uh, I will start share my screens. Uh, the course of VNSCD in uh, across ages. What, what you can see from this screen is what to expect. Uh, this is the central figure of our guidelines showing that in the young, as we've mainly discussed here, you will see that it can be either um, normal heart at autopsy or you can have a cardiomyopathy, so like HCM, DCM at the age of 20 
is five, around 25, as we heard here. And at 10, it's more the structural normal heart. So of course there uh, we have a very strong recommendation that uh, genetic testing and counseling on its potential uh, consequences should be undertaken in a multidisciplinary team. And I think this was brilliantly shown by both uh, cases that we have seen here. Uh, first of all, I would say that uh, in uh, the case of uh, Johan uh, to uh, the uh, which was really nice and uh, but also difficult. What we would do here in our um, institution now and do also to exactly what they found here is that we would uh, have uh, the genetic panel being broader now because we know that as they shown that in this uh, um, in this uh, autopsy there was a normal heart and yet it was uh, a structural. Uh, genetic finding and this is so this is where we would counsel the family to say we both look at the normal heart but it may also be in uh, the cardiomyopathy genes and we have a lot of uh, different uh, recommendations for genetic testing I think one of them that is uh, really important is that these two cases show uh, and I'll just see if you can have this, is that when you have a class uh, four or class five variant, first of all, then you do first degree screening in the relatives. And this is something that was shown in both cases. And this is very important, but you have to be very, very important, uh, very sure about how to do the bioinformatics and this is one of the recommendations. So when a putative causative variant is identified, evaluation is very important because we will only go for class four or class five. And secondly, as uh, Johan so nicely uh, pointed out, it should be in a multidisciplinary team. And in case you have a class three or class five, which was uh, uh, what uh, I believe that uh, was also discussed here, is then you reevaluate it periodically, especially when you uh, start to test children in other branches of the family. And here, of course, is a very strong recommendation. And this is something that uh, came out uh, just uh, this year, but also were, were brought forward uh, the year before in a HRS, Asian Pacific HRS document uh, that autopsy is uh, recommended in all uh, cases of uh, sudden unexpected death and always in those under 50. Now, I don't know what what the, the case is in, in your countries, but we know from uh, different um, uh, surveys that it varies a lot in Europe. And I will give you some data on why this is quite important. This is uh, data from our own series up to 50. What you see here is that if you look in cases of sudden death, then uh, in 70% it will be sudden cardiac death. The most common found finding among children one to 10 is a structural normal heart. And this include uh, toxicology. Uh, but whereas if you get uh, older, uh, the ischemia, which is here, the lighter yellow, will become more and more predominant. But of course, we also have cardiomyopathies. And when we bring this together up to uh, 50 to 70% of these may be inherited, really pointing towards that we need to do the uh, workup of the families as shown in these two cases. Um, so one thing I really would like to, to point out, which I found was very nice from the, uh, the case of uh, Georgia was the fact that they took the, um, blood sample often when you have, uh, cases of sudden cardiac death, there's the focus on one to save, uh, the child if possible. Secondly, uh, what's the prognosis and how to convey that message to the family. But often we forget to take the blood sample, which was so nicely done in this 
case. And this is pivotal in order to help uh, the patient forward. Uh, and this is something even in my institution, sometimes it's forgotten. So therefore I'm very happy that this was done in this case. And this is now a class one recommendation. So this is even without consent as we do it. And then to use it would be only with consent of the family in our institution. And I know this is different from uh, system to system, but I think in, in Europe overall, it's done with consent. I know, for example, in an Ontario, you are able to do it without consent. So that would be uh, the first, uh, uh, if the, uh, so for Georgia's case, we have provided a whole uh, flowchart in the um, in the ESC guidelines. So this is what we call scenario five. So sudden cardiac arrest. So first you look, of course, and this is for all ages. So first you lose for ischemia, then you look for structural heart disease, and then you look for primary electric diseases. And if all uh, evaluations are normal, then it's idiopathic VF, which is uh, the most common finding at cardiac arrest uh, with structural normal heart. Any comments from the panel on when the blood samples are take drawn for genetic analysis in cardiac arrest uh, survivors or non-survivors in your institution? My my institution, you say, Jacob? Yeah. For example, how when do you when do you remember to take the blood sample uh, and and keep it? Well, I I think this is a uh, this is a matter of um, uh, training people and uh, giving back results. I think it's the it's the 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 clue for that is that when when we find out a case like that, then go back to the ICU people say, look, you remember that we took blood. This is very important because now we know this family, and then explain the case that involves everyone and everybody feels very part of it. So now they they feel like they automatically it's kind of a very automatic thing that there is a, a sudden death. Uh, a droning or a near droning event, um, these type of things that they just would uh, uh, keep some blood just in case. Just and then they following day they they just share it with us and say, oh, we saw this. Uh, we have kept some blood. Uh, do you want to keep it or we throw it? Excellent, excellent. Yeah. But it's a matter of it's true that you can do a protocol, but nobody remembers. The the, the most important thing is that um, in this type of cases that they are very sad and you are with a family and deciding very tough things. It's very important to to that someone remembers. And uh, the only way to remember is that to 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 share with them that the fact of having kept this blood with, for them um, has uh, when now we are allowed to 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 study the rest of the family and we know where to look and maybe we have saved another life and and so on so to involve the people who is really at the door you know right and uh, just to answer your question of what to do with the uh, the patients with uh, on the treadmill positive stress test. Of course, she has now the diagnosis of CPVT. I totally agree with that. So uh, in in our institution, we would start with uh, uh, beta blockers, preferably uh, non-selective propanolol or uh, even better natalol if uh, you can get it in your country, and then do another stress test. Uh, if the stress test is still positive, then maybe add uh, flaconite at this uh, moment of time. In fact, for this patient, we did exactly the same. Uh, uh, beta blocker was not tolerated, and uh, we switched to Nadolol trying to do that. Then we moved to add flecainite to give less uh, Nadolol. Despite um, that, um, she needed, um, she was doing arrhythmias. So finally, we did uh, a left cardiac sympathetic denervation who helped control a little bit. Um, well, a little bit, mainly that. Now, uh, certain years after, uh, it's clearly going down. And um, and it's it's very important that uh, the we see that there is kind of this burning uh, time that it's very hot <laughs> uh, hot time of uh, ten years and then it goes kind of down and you can uh, be more kind of feel safe and so on. So we have gone through all the um, all the um, all the all the all the pathway. Let's say. 
Okay, excellent. Um, then I would like to also go to uh, Johan's case. I think this was a case of what I would term concealed cardiomyopathy uh, in the terms of uh, in the family. So actually the autopsy didn't reveal uh, cardiomyopathy and then it was the molecular autopsy that really revealed it. And for that, uh, what we do is uh, bring it up in the first line of already uh, genetic analysis. So we have now and especially more and more data on proarrhythmic um, DCN and HCM uh, where it can be seen. I think in the initial report from Elijah Baird, it was like 5% of all SATS cases where you find something. And this is something that uh, is still uh, in that ballpark. So uh, I think that that would be uh, the important point would be the uh, comprehensive autopsy and save blood for potential toxicology testing as well. In that, and that was so nicely done. Um, yes. And then um, I think what we did was also the negative uh, autopsy and then really go uh, carefully through it and then either term it SATS as or sudden unexplained uh, at death syndrome as you did. Those are uh, the same. And what we do of course there is uh, do the, the workup of the family as you've shown. And here it is very important to say that if you're non-autopsied, you are treated the same way in the algorithm. Um, but I think that in autopsy cases, it's important to state that in one third of the cases, you can say it's non-cardiac and non, therefore very low likelihood of inherited diseases such as cerebral hemorrhage, pulmonary embolism. Um, one more, uh, so yeah. I agree. So you already showed that. And then of course, what we do is then uh, the whole workup uh, of uh, the family. Uh, and as you see here, you have the echocardiography and the exercise test. Those two are class one, and then you follow down if they are negative, if they don't give you uh, the diagnosis. And I won't go into that. Um, I would say that one thing that may and also be helpful is that you can have the uh, pocket guideline in your as an app and there the flowcharts will also, also be provided. Uh, I think that's really nicely uh, done here. Uh, and with that, I'd rather uh, open up the discussion. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, very interesting to see, you know, the implementation of these cases in the perspective of the guidelines. Uh, some questions have been coming up uh, through the chat, but I welcome uh, all the participants to open up the mics. Ideally, also the, the camera so we can see your face and discuss uh, uh, directly, but no pressure here. Um, anyway, um, while some questions are coming, I... I think it's uh, some very interesting topics have been brought up. Um, the importance of uh, evaluating a, in a structured way, an integrated way with multidisciplinary teams, either sudden cardiac death, uh, descendants or the family uh, of these people. This of, will, would, of course, include if we had had a case of a survivor of a sudden cardiac arrest. Um, and this uh, will include a comprehensive uh, group of uh, so clinical information tests and genetic testing. And the very important thing is that genetic testing is um, uh, interpreted in an appropriate way. And this is one of the questions that is coming or has been brought up by Arthur on the chat is, uh, and Johan presented in the case, not only do we use genetic testing uh, for um, diagnosis in the family and family screening, but we may also use it for risk stratification. And in the guidelines, Jacob, maybe you want to comment a little bit how genetic testing has become more important in risk stratification. And in the case of sudden cardiac death uh, and um, occult cardiomyopathy, uh, Johan has suggested that maybe these variants may have carry a higher risk. 
Arthur uh, was commenting on some uh, publications in the literature that there we could maybe question it. So I wonder if you wanted to discuss this openly with the rest of the group. Sure. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, that was a very nice point, Johan. Uh, and I, um, I would say what we have done in this guideline is uh, very much aligned with the old HCM guideline. So using the HCM uh, risk calculator, but not ne 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 saying that we don't um, get more information. And I do think that uh, this study that you showed, which is one study, carries a lot of weight. And probably we would also lean towards that, but it's not covered as such in the guidelines uh, currently. Probably there's a ESC 2023 guidelines where it's uh, going to be covered even more. We have one of the chairs who uh, is, is hosting this event. and uh, But I, I do think that, of course, an expert's opinion, I think you can use it. But I would really be careful with using these kind of studies in non-expert centers. There I would prefer that people follow the guidelines and especially also maybe look into whether it's shown in one study or whether it's also been validated. And I, I would be, yeah, I didn't open up that part of the discussion, but I, I'd like to hear what Johan and, and, and maybe also Arthur Wilde and, uh, and what you think, Elena. Yeah, maybe Arthur, it's a good point, moment for you to yeah. comment. <laughs> I, I was referring to that very first study on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy from Bill Watkins in the New England Journal in 1990, where they showed this particular variant on position four or three. I don't recall the exact details. And they showed that that variant was a very malignant myosin heavy chain seven variant. And the later studies, it was shown that that was simply not the case. It was an exceptional family. And, and so I wonder whether the family that you, uh, that the, the publication that you showed, Johan, from that Spanish uh, family, might have been a similar example. So just using that single, single paper as an example, how malignant this, this mutation is, is, is a bit dangerous, I think. Yeah, so I, I fully agree. So this is a moving, uh, moving field, and I think it is an evolving, uh, evolving uh, insights that are still uh, fully underway. Uh, I also agree that if we just base uh, our risk stratification on one family, I fully agree that this, this is probably not the way to go. But I think if we if we see that uh, that that there's clear cost segregation in multiple families where there's a clear cost segregation between a, a certain genotype and a phenotype and uh, associated to risk profile, I think the data becomes more solid. Uh, yeah, but if, if that comes from the same country or the same city, these families might be related, and it might actually be one family. It might be a it might, yeah. might be a founder a founder effect indeed. But yeah, founder effects are yeah it is of course it is a it is a subpopulation. Um, but uh, but I think uh, yeah this in this specific sp subpopulation at least there there is a yeah even though there might be a, still a huge uh, het uh, genetic heterogeneity I think it has been shown that you have evidence that there is a higher risk profile and then of course if you want to translate that to your own specific family where you already have sudden cardiac death and you have at least one of those um, risk markers then yeah I think. I think, uh, of course, we need more data. But in this particular case, we, of course, had an open discussion with our patient. And we said, OK, this is what we know about this variant in this specific specific population. Um, her brother had a sudden car like that. There was no other reason found. We, didn't, we did a quite broad genetic analysis. We didn't find any other genetic risk marker. Um, toxicology was negative. That was done by the, quite extensively by the forensic pathologist. Yeah, and then we had an open discussion, and then we came to the shared decision to, to implant the ICD. Um, and until now, she didn't have any uh, arrhythmic events, So, uh, but we will see. But I, I fully agree that uh, the, the, the jury is still out. I think uh, uh, risk stratification should be scrutinized a lot. Um, and uh, But I think here we had quite extensive data, even though it is uh, it, it may be a founder population, but we had quite extensive data, which uh, until now is the best we have on this, uh, on this uh, variant. Um, that it might be associated with a, with, a, with a higher risk profile than what we would expect uh, based on other troponin T2 variants. 
So, um, Jacob, I think you a short comment, I think, and maybe Thomas, you want to share briefly also your experience. Um, we we should be finishing now, but I I have begged to prolong uh, just until two, uh, just to keep a, a couple of extra minutes to keep, to have some discussion. So I I think this is a very important uh, topic, and and you also you can I put a comment, or do you want to comment on this as well? This aspect. Um, no, I was I, I actually uh, think it, it was just going to be a suggestion. Maybe this is a good uh, idea for a registry in the ERM actually to evaluate the uh, prognosis of uh, TT, uh, TN and T2 variants, troponin T variants, uh, uh, cardiomyopathy. So that's it. And really, uh, did you want to say something about this? Otherwise, I would change topics to what. Yeah, I just have one. I just have one point, And that is the way that we dealt with this. And this is more in DCM is that you see in the guideline and in the flowchart, we have added four what we considered four secure uh, well validated, as Arthur pointed out, uh, genes where we know that there's a high risk for arrhythmia in the indication for ICD. And so it, it, and this is after really scrutinizing large series and looking at each series and to be sure there's no founder effect and so forth. And this is also for laminase, we have endorsed the laminase calculator but then uh, put, so there it's also 10% over five years, but then say they have to have a cardiac phenotype. So really making it more difficult because the problem is if you have a certain gender, a certain mutation, then you will always have 10% over five years. So regardless, they should all get an ICD. So therefore, uh, this is what we have, uh, have done. So it is implemented, but it's implemented in the DCM, uh, not in ACM as it is because we didn't find the, the evidence sufficient. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the 2023. Okay, so I have two general discussion points, but these are recurrent aspects that have come up following both the guidelines, the meetings I've been to following the guidelines and the 2022 expert consensus on genetic testing. One of them is, okay, you have a uh, sudden cardiac death descent with no apparent cause. Uh, uh, in principle, you should be testing first for primary arrhythmias, and I welcome Arthur to start answering this. And then if that panel is negative, then you would go to explore on uh, the possible pathogenic uh, cardiomyopathy genes. Um, nowadays, what happens is really that people have panels, so people go straight ahead and analyze everything. So uh, what's well, your approach Elena, and how would you... Elena, we have solved it by making, designing ourselves a sudden cardiac death panel that yeah. has, has the most important genes from both. Uh, and altogether, it's still about 50 or, or 60 genes, but it's the most important uh, arrhythmia genes and the most important cardiomyopathy genes. So these cases would have been picked up with that particular panel. Good, that's perfect. And then a second question that I have, it's for the guidelines for you, Jacob, is uh, we have seen a case of uh, occult cardiomyopathy. Uh, and... Um, Actually, cardiomyopathies in general, most of them uh, express their phenotype after the adult age. So from, uh, from what we see in the guidelines, if you evaluate the family members uh, up until the adulthood and the baseline uh, family screening is negative, no follow-up evaluation is uh, proposed, let's say. Uh, what happens with this? cases of occult or later onset cardiomyopathy that you may miss? That's a very good point. Uh, first of all, if we would have a positive uh, molecular autopsy with a cardiomyopathy gene, then of course we would uh, continue follow them. Um, secondly, I, I would say they are really nice follow-up data on SATs relative or SOTS relative. Uh, the first study came from Amsterdam, and this is something that I always refer to my patients when I see them and I say, we have very good data, follow-up data on these families. So once you have been into our scheme of the careful workup uh, and everything is normal, we know 
it, uh, the outcome is very good. And then we talk about risk and we always talk. Uh, so, and, but you're right in the guidelines, we say that after adolescence, we discharge to, to, to answer your, your, your question, but it's based on this. Okay. Any more comments or, uh, so Ruth, uh, I missed a, a recommendation for re-evaluation of negative genetic test in the new guideline. Uh, not every sudden cardiac death is followed up by an expert center in broad panels. That's a very good point. <laughs> yeah, I think that's something that uh, every one of us is. So first of all, it, in the guidelines, it's stated that you should reevaluate the class three and class four. We have no specific, you're right, Ruth, we have no specifics stating that every uh, analysis should be followed up by if there are new genes that are in the new consensus papers or uh, ClinVar or other have, have shown now that it's a solid gene or strong gene that they, it should be included. But this is what all uh, good uh, labs should do, of course. Uh, now, how this is done uh, and periodically how it's done, it's probably done case by case. Uh, but I would strongly uh, suggest that we do exactly what you do and do it systematically. And I'm not sure that anybody has a good uh, system for that in place. I know there are papers on how much the yield is. Uh, and there is some uh, yield, of course, if you have the newest uh, panels and update it, uh, I should say, also bioinformatics. So there, there are two, two questions in one. So Arthur, did you want to comment? Because I thought you raised your hand or not? <laughs> no, I, I was trying to raise my hand because there was one question in the chat, which I think is very important. Yes. And that is, would it be legitimate to test for RCM genes at all without a suggested phenotype in the system? That is the question for your hand. Yeah. If there would have been no phenotype, then I guess there would have been no reason for genetic testing, but she had a kind of phenotype, right? Yeah, so I think the phenotype is, uh, as they often present uh, or sometimes present here, was not uh, not super convincing. Eh? Um, so if there was no phenotype at all, uh, so then I think uh, we would have uh, first uh, checked, of course, in the in the in the brother eh? uh, whether we find something. And if it is a clear class five, I think there still is an, uh, an indication to do that because you can do predictive testing. Eh? And because, of course, now the phenotype may not be present at the moment, but it may still develop um, later on. So I think that's important to uh, to organize the follow up in the in the sister. Um, but it all depends, of course, on the phenotype in the sister first, and also in the on the classification of the variant in the in the in the in the person that had certain cardiac death. So um, if the classification would would have been three, then of course we wouldn't have done anything. I think. So with this, I think I have. I would like to thank all the speakers. I think you're all. Uh, you have presented really wonderful cases and a great discussion. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, yeah to more webinars and to meeting you in the next uh, events. Thank you. If anybody wants to add some comment. Otherwise, thank you, Elena. <laughs> yes, thank you for the nice discussion. Yes. Okay. Perfect. So. I'll let you go back to work or whatever you're doing. <laughs> Bye. Thank you all and happy holidays. Happy holiday, everybody. <laughs>